Welcome, my name is Nalini Haynes, this is Dark Magazine and today I'm talking to Francesca Haig. Francesca grew up in Tasmania, got a PhD from the University of Melbourne and was a senior lecturer at the University of Chester. Her poetry has been published in literary journals and anthologies in Australia and England and her first collection of poetry, Bodies of Water, was published in 2006 that the Anne Elder Award highly commended. In 2010, Francesca was awarded a Hawthornden Fellowship. She lives in London with her husband and son. Francesca's novel, The Fire Sermon, is the first in a post-apocalyptic trilogy and her second, The Map of Bones, has just been released and they're being translated into more than 20 languages. Welcome, Francesca. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, now, your first two novels, The Fire Sermon and The Map of Bones, have both been published. What, what can you tell us about the story? Um, it's, it's fairly bleak. Um, it takes place in a world that is, is our world, but not as we know it. So it's 400 years after the world has been entirely devastated by a nuclear blast. Um, and in the sort of scorched remains of, of this world, uh, people have evolved because of the um, the nuclear radiation in such a way that everyone is born as twins. Um, but when one twin dies, so does the other, so the twins share this fatal bond. Um, and it's a very divided society um, because one of each pair is physically perfect and the other bears the burden of, of the mutations caused by the radiation. Um, and they're known as the Omegas as opposed to their, their perfect alpha counterparts. Um, and so the, the story of the Fire Sermon series follows two twins in particular, Cass and Zach. Um, and their, well Cass really, and Cass's struggles to, to survive in a world where she's linked to a twin with whom she has both everything in common because they will share the moment of their death and, and nothing at all. And the conflict between the two twins spreads from uh, a very intimate story of the two of them to, to encompass the whole world and bring it to the brink of war. Mm. Um, you've, you said, I think all the best dystopias get their impact from, not from how dramatically different they are from current life, but from how familiar they are. How is your representation of, of current life in the Fire Sermon and the Map of Bones familiar? Um, I think that we don't have to look too far or too hard at our own society to see how very dystopian it is in lots of ways. I mean, I've lived in England now for the last 10 years and certainly under the current um, Tory government, we're seeing more and more um, cuts in welfare, um, more and more disenfranchisement and marginalization of the poor and of the disabled um, and the issue of disability is obviously very central to the fire sermon. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the broader um, class issue that runs through the fire sermon um, we see everywhere our world is divided. Of course any any dystopia is a utopia for those on top so it'd be very easy for many people to look around the current society and think it suits them very well indeed, but um, I think it's, it's depressing and, and horrifying and hopefully galvanizing mm. to think about how much our, our current world represents the dystopia of the fire sermon and, and other novels. Um, I, didn't, I didn't set out to write a didactic book about our society, a sort of a preaching book talking about the wrongs of our world, but um, I think that if, uh, if you read the fire sermon and and are minded to look with fresh eyes at the world around you, then I'd be, I'd be very pleased. Mm. Cass, the, the central character in your trilogy, has an invisible disability, which is seeing the future. You could have slotted this into the magical disability trope, but you took it in a different direction. Yeah, it was really, really important to me that, um, that the central character not be immune to the disabilities that the rest of the, the Omega characters are struggling with. I felt like that would have been a huge, huge cop-out to say, this is a book about the disenfranchisement of the disabled, but oh, look, our main character conveniently has 
um, a disability that's in fact a magical gift and it's not a magical gift. She, she has this psychic ability to sort of catch glimpses of the future but um, what I tried um, very hard to do was to make sure that it wasn't it's never seen as a gift or a skill. It's a it's a nightmarish burden. She gets these these flashes of the blast that destroyed the world, um, and of of things to come. Usually not good things, and and it really brings her to the brink of madness. Particularly in the Map of Bones, and we we in the Map of Bones we meet um, one other seer and see the consequences of living with this kind of thing. So it was hugely important to me that. Um, that Cass struggle with disabilities like the rest of the Amiga characters and also because the trope of the, um, you know, the, the chosen one with the magical gift is, is perhaps a bit exhausted at this point. Um, and also because I think so many disabilities aren't visible and it was important that I, to me, that, that, that the novel explores um, ideas of invisible disabilities and of mental disabilities as well. It sounds to me like you're quite passionate about disability. Um, why is that? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, it's not really for me as someone who's not themselves disabled to, to set myself up in any way as a, as a spokeswoman for, for these issues. Um, but I, I'd always been interested in um, disability theory through my, my studies when I was working in academia. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose there's, there's a, a continuum along a lot of the, the things that I was interested in academically, sort of um, gender theory, disability theory, all the things that lead us to question who has power and how power is constructed and maintained in our society have always been fascinating to me. But the real interest in disability came through the writing of the novel. Um, I, I never set out to write a book about disability, but it turned out that, that that's what I did. And there are times that I do feel a bit awkward about that because I'm not disabled myself. And, you know, the, the extremely important phrase, nothing about us without us, you know, the catchphrase. Yes, you're a person without a disability and you actually know that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I, I do feel that although it's important to have... Um, writing about disability in um, in literature, it's not first and foremost got to come from people like me. It's also most most of all about um, finding um, voices from those who have much more immediate experience than I do. Um, but I've, I've done my best in the novel to, to try and, um, and foreground ideas of disability and, and it's, it's something that really fascinates me. But yeah, I, I'm always the first to sort of say it, it's not about me at that point. Have you seen people, like on the internet there are discussions about um, gender theory and men can say stuff on behalf of women, championing, championing women and feminism and they can be applauded and they have, their words carry so much more weight. Whereas women, if they say exactly the same thing, oh, you're just whining, you're a feminazi, you're whatever. And the same thing applies with, with disability. Yeah, I think that, that that's a really unfortunate trend, that those whose voices we most need to hear are those whose voices are most often silenced. I mean, it, it's a maddening thing. You could, I could talk for hours about uh, feminism and, and gender theory and the role of, of male allies um, and, and I think as a, as a non-disabled writer, the best, the best I could hope for is to be an ally. And that means using my voice to, to try and say what I, what I can about disability. But I think in, in my role as, a, as an ally, really, it's about listening more than talking um, and about acknowledging the limitations of my own experience when it comes to talking about disability and trying where possible with whatever platform I have to amplify the voices of those who have much more immediate experience than I do. Well, I think that's awesome. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that, thank you. Um, apparently DreamWorks has purchased the film rights to the fire sermon. Yeah, DreamWorks op optioned the film rights, um, but I, I have learned that Hollywood moves in very slow and slightly mysterious ways. So I, I'm trying very hard to focus just on, on the novels and not get caught up in, in what is or isn't happening in terms of the film. But it was, it was hugely exciting 
when that happened, it's one of those moments when you, you genuinely worry that you might wake up and find that, that it's all a dream. There was a period of about two or three weeks when I kept jabbing my husband in the ribs and saying, is it real? Is this real? Is this stuff that's happened? Not, not just the film stuff, but the, the, the publication itself. That was enough to, to make me giddy. So the, the film stuff was just gravy on top. And you, the Fire Sermon wasn't your first publication? No, it was my first novel. Um, and I, I'd been publishing poetry for years and, and poetry is and, and remains really my, my great literary love. It's what brought me into um, to writing and, and I always, I feel like a bit of a, um, like I've been unfaithful to poetry really. Poetry was my first love and then I was sort of strumped off and spending years busily writing novels and I have very little time for poetry now in terms of my own writing. Um, but I, I definitely do want to get back to poetry. I have this sort of idyllic vision that I'll finish the third book in this series. And much as I've loved writing this series, um, it's been very all-consuming. You know, three, a three-book deal. First you say, yay, three-book deal, and then the crushing realisation, oh, I have to write three books. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have this idea that after I've finished the third book, book and that's all edited and tucked away for good, I will sort of slip away and spend three months immersed in nothing but poetry. So I did I did have a, a collection of poetry published and this is, gosh, can it be, yeah, 10 years ago now. In fact, it was, yeah, 2006. Um, and and that, seems, that seems a long way away. Um, but I, I am, am sitting on half of my next collection ready to go. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting back to that when the novels allow. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. In other interviews, you've mentioned how much you value the editing process and you wish people would ask questions about the editing process. Would you like to explain why editing is so important? Well, I just think that um, there's a lot of of idealisation of the idea of writing as a solitary craft, that you lock yourself away in a picturesque um, attic and you produce this work of solitary genius and that's it and and of course day in day out the vast majority of the the work of a writer is is solitary um, the ideas and and the hard work they have to come from you but I've just become very aware through the process of publication um, and through the the experience of working with my editors both both in, in England and and the US of the value that they that they add, that sounds like a very business speak way of saying it. But um, I, I know that the novels are so much stronger as a result of the questions that the editors ask. Um, and I've always been a big fan of of taking thoughtful feedback and workshopping and so on. And and for years, I'd I'd made a living from teaching creative writing, so I was always telling my students. Um, you know, you're not obliged to agree with the feedback you get, but you are obliged to consider it. And and we were workshopping day in day out. Um, so it would have been really hypocritical of me to to be an author who was precious about my work when the editors finally um, kicked in. But um, particularly with the second book, I I really don't think it would be anywhere near the book that it is um, without the input of of my editors. The first book, The Fire Sermon, I had years and years to write it, so. Um, there was no pressure, there were no deadlines, I had no baby at that point. Um, so it was, it was really easy to take my time and polish, polish, polish and I had plenty of time to run it past um, you know, a, a small circle of friends and family whose input I really value and, and to take on board their feedback and then to run it past my agent a couple of times. Um, and to do editorial work with her. So by the time it went to the publishers, it was in really pretty good shape. And the publishers did give me useful feedback and push me, um, my editors, with, with my publishers. But, um, but it wasn't a particularly protracted or painful process. And then with book two, the process of editing was so hard and so horrible, but so usefully horrible. Mm. The, mm. the editors just kept on asking me the hard questions. And... What I found with editorial feedback is that the, the majority of the time that you get editorial feedback, it's not stuff that comes out of left field and completely shocks you. It's usually things that you know, if you're really honest with yourself, you haven't got away with, but you thought you'd managed to paper over the cracks and the editors sort of look at it and say, nah. -uh. 
So because I was writing The Map of Bones to a deadline with editors waiting and, and all the, the pressures that, that came with the publication of book one, it was a very different experience. And instead of having six years to write it in dribs and drabs, I, I had 18 months and a baby and a deadline. It was a completely different experience. Um, and so instead of just being able to wait for the solution to problems in the book to sort of appear organically three months down the line when I was going for a jog, as they might have done when I was writing the fire sermon. I had to sort of push through and push through all the the blockages that I encountered with the, the map of bones, and it was really hard. And the editors were just so useful with that. And they were patient. Every time I pushed a deadline back, they... Um, they swallowed that, but they also just kept asking me the really hard questions. And I, it was a pretty horrible process, but I'm so grateful for it now because I look at the book and I'm proud of the map of bones in a way that I wasn't really with. I mean, I, I am very proud of the fire sermon. It's my first novel and it's always going to hold a special place in my heart. But the map of bones feels very hard won to me because the, the struggle was so acute. Um, and because the, the transformation between that very, very rough draft that I handed in to my editors the first time round and, and what now appears between the, the published covers is, is so huge. Can you give an example of one of the questions that really helped you? Um, I'm trying to think if I can do that without, without spoilers. Um, I think one of the interesting things about working with editors is that you can agree, you always tend to agree with them about the problem and say, yes, or I didn't nail that, but you don't have to agree with them about the solution. So there's one thing that happens in the map of bones where I've made a decision regarding a particular group of people. Um, and the first draft, the editor said, that's a bit too dark. Um, this thing that happens to the, this group is, is really dark and maybe we need to give the readers a bit more hope. And it doesn't quite work that, that Cass and her friends are, are not in a position to, to help these people at this stage. And I knew that that scene hadn't worked. And I went away and, and, and I always allow myself 24 hours after editorial feedback to kind of simmer down because your initial response is a kind of, how very dare you? Um, you know, this, this is, so I, I allow myself what I call ego time when I, I let myself stomp around the house in a foul mood for 24 hours and then I say okay back to work um, and so after that initial period when I was able to acknowledge yeah that scene didn't work what I ended up doing to the group in question was far 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 worse far far more brutal um, but it worked and the and the editors came back and they'd said you know they'd, they'd sort of suggested saving this group and what I did instead to this group was infinitely crueler and more merc merciless and harsher, but it, it worked in the book. So it was a nice example of them recognizing very accurately the problem, suggesting a solution, and me finding a different solution, but um, but one that actually was more powerful in the end. But they were bang on about about the scene not working initially. Oh, I suspect I have an idea what. Oh, you've because you've you've read the map of bones, right? Then you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, but I agree with you about not spoiling things. So yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, and it, it was, it was um, if we're speaking about the same event, it was tragic, it was profound, but it also worked. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a, my, my favourite quote about writing is from Flaubert, and he says, and I, I may be paraphrasing slightly, I'm not sure if I've got it exactly, but he says, never doubt that poetry is as exact a science as geometry. And I love this idea that there is a rightness in writing when it gets right. There's a sense that it's the only answer that it could have been, just as in maths or geometry there's, there's a correct answer. And, of course, we think of, of poetry and, and prose as much more creative than, than maths, so that's perhaps another debate, but or much more open to, to multiple solutions. But there is a sense as a writer when you're working that, when you've got it, it settles into place and you think, yes, that's the only answer that, that, that works in this context. That's, that's not only something that I've imagined, something new, but it's also correct. There's a sense that, of accuracy. Um, yes. And it yes. works. I think that's often the, the sense that I feel is, yes, that that's, that's not just picturesque or moving, but it's right. It, it's the answer that the story was looking for. Yeah, and I think at times authors try to make the stakes too high for the sake of it. 
Yeah. I think in this particular situation, it fit with who the characters were. And yeah. it was... It's, sorry? Sorry. Oh. I, the question of stakes is, is a really a really juicy one because we're always told as authors, you know, raise the stakes, raise the stakes. Um, but of course there's nothing more hollow than an unearned jeopardy, a sense that, mm. that we don't mm. care and that it's it's not organic to the characters, mm. The, mm. the scramble. So there was, I mean, there is a, a big event at the end of the fire sermon, book one, um, where the stakes become very high and there was debate, in fact, um, when, when the fire sermon went um, to auction, we met with um, a lot of publishers who were, were bidding for it and one publisher didn't want that sad event to occur, was saying, you know, this is a deal breaker for us, we can't, we can't do this. Um, and I did understand and I, I myself have enormous affection for that character and, and the, the events at the end of the fire sermon were, were really, really sad for me to write. But um, I felt that it had to stay because, um, not because I'm a sadist and I like to torture my readers or, or, or a masochist who likes to torture myself, but because this is serious. Hmm. You know, the, the world that Cass is living in and the perils of that world are for real and she has to suffer very real consequences. Um, she can't get off scot-free if she's going to be trying to make change in a world as hellish as, as the world of the fire sermon. So um, it felt to me that terrible things that happen, they have to be earned and you can't feel that you're just um, killing people off for the sake of some cheap, cheap emotion, um, but that they have to, to arise organically from the scenario and the characters that you've created. And, and when they do, there's a sense of inevitability and again of rightness that it was the only way that particular story could have ended. Um, the the um, Divergent trilogy comes to mind where, where the third book, I know there was absolute outrage from fans about events in the climax of the third book. But I actually thought that there were flaws in the writing, but the, the event that caused the fans' outrage was actually one of the strengths of that book. Yeah. I, I, I do know what you, you mean from, from having read about it. I've only read the first of the Divergent series. Well, um, I won't spoil it for you. No, I actually think the no. first one was the best one too. Yeah. Well, no, but I, I have actually, I have, you know, via the, the beauties of the internet, I do know exactly what you mean. And, mm. and I think from, from what I've read, that sounds like quite a courageous decision. And again, if we're talking, if we're trying to make readers believe that this is, is life and death stuff, Sometimes the deaths are not going to be palatable, and they're not going to fit with with what the a, a neat happy ending would demand. And I and I think that there's a um, a truthfulness in that that is often um, very powerful. How often do we get an unadulterated happy ending in real life? And how often, when a story gets an unadulterated happy ending, does it just come across as being saccharine sweet? Sometimes yeah. it's nice, but sometimes... I mean, I can understand the desire for a happy ending in, in real life, obviously, but, but also in fiction. And, and I have a soft spot sometimes. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big, daggy Charles Dickens fan. I adore Dickens, and there's something hugely satisfying about the ends when he, he parcels up the, the rewards and punishments. Um, but I, I love most of all the things that are, are left open. My, one of my favourite endings in literature is the ending of Twelfth Night um, when Shakespeare gives us this implausibly happy, neat, comedic ending, but there's a fly in the ointment and Malvolio is cursing and shaking his fists and swearing revenge in the middle of this pantomime happy ending and it's so uneasy and so problematic and so wonderful because of that. That's one of my favourite moments in Shakespeare because it doesn't fit. Um, and it's like um, a bit of the messy, contradictory, unsatisfying reality has wandered in from stage left in the middle of this implausibly happy ending, and I, and I really love that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm all for happy endings in, in real life. May there be plenty more of them, but in fiction I, I often find them implausible. Mm, yeah. And there yeah. aren't many in in the world of the fire sermon. I'm in the process now of writing the end of book three 
and have always known what it was going to be. And I, I wonder if I'm going to have some tense phone calls with my editors about about the ending because it's it's not a Dickens ending. Well, that'll be interesting. <laughs> I won't ask any more. Um, going off with a tangent before we get into really murky, spoilery territory there. <laughs> Oh, it's so hard to walk away from that. That you, You've hooked me, but yes. Okay, you've completed a PhD and yeah. your main research area is the ethics and poetics of the contemporary historical novel. Oh, so you really have done your research. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is a contemporary historical novel? Well, I'm, I mean, it's that's not a, a trick phrase. There's no tricksy academia there. I was, I was interested in looking at um, contemporary writing about historical events. Okay. Um, I, I focused in particular on um, on three novels, um, two of which are lifelong favourites of mine. Uh, well, not lifelong. I, I didn't read them in the crib, to be fair. But um, <laughs> Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is you know the absolutely astounding contemporary classic about um, slavery. Mm -hmm. um, Kim Scott's Benang, which is a wonderful book by Kim Scott, who's an Indigenous Australian author, um, and it looks at um, some of the traumas of colonisation from the Indigenous perspective, and um, and Michael's Fugitive Pieces, which is this incredible, incredible book about um, the the Holocaust and its legacy, mm -hmm. and that led me down a, a sort of wormhole that I ended up in my in my academic life post PhD specialising broadly in, in representations of, of the Holocaust, um, which again is, is not cheerful subject matter. You've got sort of post-apocalyptic novels and, and Holocaust literature in my day job. Um, so it's all, it's all grim stuff for someone who is naturally a really cheerful person. I, I ended up immersing myself in the most dark possible sort of realms of literature. Do you think maybe you can see some light in the dark places? Um, I'm always wary when we talk about the Holocaust of the idea of, of light in the dark places because I think there's a real risk, and you see this in some bad Holocaust literature, of trying to offer a kind of false consolation, of, of saying that things are all right when there are things that are not all right and, and cannot be put, put right or made better. Um, I, I do think that on a personal level I'm, I'm perhaps drawn to that stuff because I know on some level that I'm robust enough to cope with it because I am kind of irritatingly chirpy in my, in my daily life. So um, whether the, the immersion in Holocaust literature is a necessary counterbalance to my annoying optimism or whether the optimism um, came second, I'm not sure. It might be a chicken and egg situation. But um, I, I mean, it's always difficult when people talk about enjoying the books that they love. Um, mm. Because I don't think, you know, most of those books, both Beloved and, and Fugitive Pieces, I don't think you, they're books that you enjoy. They're books that you kind of endure in a way. Um, but there's such beauty in them as well. Um, which is in itself not unproblematic, the idea of writing about unspeakable real-life horror with beautiful language. Um, are, we, are we then back in the, in the question of making palatable things that are unspeakable, of finding beauty and consolation where there wasn't any to be found in, in the real experience. Um, you can see that I could bang on for hours and hours about this. Yes. Um, but I did find it absolutely fascinating. I, I loved um, studying these things when I was working in academia. And I, and I hope to go back in some form to doing those things again. Maybe when your son's a bit older. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you've got a book finished. Yeah. So how with this is your thesis did you come to write a post apocalyptic YA novel well it in some ways it's it's not that surprising i think um i i think there's a lot of writing dystopian and post apocalyptic writing that draws broadly on um ideas and imagery from the holocaust um I've, I've published articles on this myself, actually, um, it, with my academic hat on, um, about the sort of resonances of the Holocaust in um, in post-apocalyptic and dystopian writing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's perhaps 
perhaps eminently predictable that I ended up writing a, a post-apocalyptic novel. Um, it was always going to be dark, I think, yes. Um, yes. whatever I ended up writing. Um, and I, I don't think I was really consciously aware of how much the Holocaust had impacted on on my writing until I, I took a step back from it. And, and there are things now that seem glaringly obvious. Um, in fact, one thing that an interviewer mentioned to me a few months ago, and I'd been genuinely, and it now seems completely implausible that I could have been oblivious to this, but very simple things like the Omegas in the Fire Sermon novels are branded um, on their forehead, marked with the Omega sign. And an editor said to me a few months ago, well, you know, obviously this is a reference to the um, the tattooing of Holocaust victims in some of the camps. And, you know, I feel embarrassed even to admit that that hadn't occurred to me as someone who'd spent an academic career immersed in Holocaust studies, but that had genuinely gone under my radar. It now seems glaringly obvious. So I think on many, many levels, the Holocaust was just quietly inflecting um, the the writing of the fire sermon. But it's it's not in any way an allegory for... The, the Holocaust or what happened. It's just that the the awful truth is that the horrors of the Holocaust reflected all too accurately our, our ideas of the worst possible apocalypse. Um, the Nazis made that come about. So when we write about an apocalypse and dystopia, we, we often find ourselves envisaging it in terms of the Holocaust because rightly or wrongly in the Western imagination, that is where we go to when we think of the worst of the worst. Okay, so you've written a couple of novels that can be read as deeply as the reader desires, delving yep. into significant social issues, including, you know, echoes of the Holocaust. And yet, you're a Twilight fan. Dun, dun, dun! Why? And why is this position difficult for you? Well, it's it's very difficult. I mean, I'm... I'm the first to admit that I um, that I devoured all the Twilight books when they came out, as did sort of everyone I know. But um, they are also incredibly problematic. I mean, mainly from a, a gender perspective. I can tell that you've done your homework and you've read that chapter that I published again with an <laughs> academic hat on about about the problematic nature of being a someone who has enjoyed these books, but who who is aware of of all their their issues. Um, and I, I think as, as a writer now, there's not, there's not much mileage for me in, in slagging off other authors, but I, I do feel very strongly that although there are great pleasures in um, the sort of absurd, fun fantasia of the, the Twilight world, the, the gender stuff is, is really, really problematic. I mean, the whole, I'm so romantic, I've been creeping into your house and watching you sleep for months on end, uh, swoon is is really problematic, particularly if you're writing a book that's aimed squarely at a young adult audience, which I think I think Mayer is. Um, so I was in the in the article that you've read. I was just riffing a little bit on on why it is that intelligent women who identify as feminists find themselves enjoying this kind of story. I mean, I, I mentioned in that article, I had a, a very very um, brilliant PhD student at the university who asked to borrow the next Twilight book and I handed it over in her pigeonhole in a brown paper bag because I think it would have been frowned upon in the English department for this uh, this book to have been spotted in her pigeonhole in the corridor. And it's that kind of um, idea of, of shame, I suppose. I mean, I mentioned before, I said I'll admit to, being a, to having enjoyed Twilight um, so this idea of, of guilty pleasures and, and what are the pleasures that we find in these books when on the one hand we, we find great fault with their writing and, and even more fault with their um, problematic gender politics. But on the other hand, there we are eagerly turning the pages. So I was just trying to explore that idea a little bit and, um, and trying to argue that I think for many people part of the fun is is this picking apart, is those conversations that you can have, whether online or in person, um, where you can um, discuss the, the terrible gender politics of the twilight world. Um, but look, I did, I bought, read and enjoyed, so um, it is a complex thing. Well, 
I, I have to admit that if I read a book that I love, it's actually quite difficult to write a review. Yeah. Because I don't have a lot to say. If it's a book that I'm ambivalent about, you know, as in I love bits of it and I hate bits of it, now that's a review I can get my teeth into. Yeah, and I think there is something really appealing about this idea of getting your teeth into. Um, this idea that we don't turn off our critical faculties when we enjoy something and there can be real pleasure in picking something apart and, and um, dissecting it in a, in a way that doesn't preclude pleasure. That that's not a dry academic exercise, that that's actually part of the pleasure, I think, in some of these fandoms. Why do you think that the traditional mainstream views of fandom assume uncritical love? Well, I think it goes all the way back through. I mean, even the, the etymology of the word, which goes back to this idea of fanaticism. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very easily consumable idea, isn't it? It's very mm -hmm. easy to, to put people in those neat boxes. Um, and in the same way that so many stereotypes are... are um, are easy to swallow, this idea that um, the same, for example, of, of nerds or sci-fi fans, for example, as these sort of um, socially awkward, um, geeky idiots, whereas in fact so many of the genre fiction fans that, that I've encountered, and, and I count myself as a genre fiction fan, aren't necessarily these social misfits that, you know, the comic book guy in The Simpsons would have you believe. So I think the idea of fans as kind of screaming lunatics who unquestionably and unquestioningly devour everything produced by um, by an author or, or series is is really problematic partly because it's so gendered it's almost always females that are depicted as these fans these consumers um, you know from the screaming Beatlemania sort of girl to the um, what was they called the twy mums was that what they yes. Yes. yeah yes. Um, so there's something very dismissive, I think, in the idea of, of things that, that women enjoy. Are very, people are very quick to dismiss that as, as automatically uh, a sort of mindless consumerist um, mania um, and, and people are often reluctant to look more closely at how those pleasures um, and forms of engagement with text can be much more complex and interesting than that. I think there's a lot of um, gender baggage implicit in, in the way that people dismiss fandom. So why is it problematic to marginalise these films and fans? Well, I just think it's it's a way of um, failing to look in a... It, it's a missed opportunity because it fails to consider um, what the real appeal is and what they might offer. So it's very easy to write them off and say, that's girly crap, for example, or that's chick lit. I mean, the question of chick lit, it drives me up the wall, but um, uh, a book about... Uh, a woman and her experience is chick lit, is somehow domestic, is small scale, is insignificant, is likely to be um, not to be reviewed, to be marketed as chick lit, to have a, a set of high heels slapped on the front of the book. Um, whereas a book about um, a male experience is universal and important and serious literature. If Jonathan so, Franzen writes a book, it's about exactly. America. But if Diane Blacklock writes Wife for Hire or Marianne Keyes writes Rachel's Holiday, that's chickly. Absolutely. And I think Jennifer Weiner is really, really good on this topic. She's had some good exchanges um, with and about Jonathan Franzen where she's, she's argued very articulately about how, how problematic and how reductive these labels are. Um, because it's, it's just part of a, a broader continuum of marginalisation of women's interests, women's concerns and women's cultural productions. Um, so I think um, it's, just, it's just another part of patriarchal culture. Um, but it's great that it's now being questioned on, on a big platform and I think um, Jennifer Weiner and also Jenny Trout uh, are two authors who are really good at, at tearing down that sort of nonsense when they encounter it, which is all too often. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that for an academic to take on a fan identity, they also load up on anxiety. You've not only take on, taken on a fan identity publicly, but you've also written fantasy in spite of being a professional academic. What challenges has this brought you? The, the change from, from writing um, 
academic research and and quite sort of I suppose poetry that was perceived as as literary or serious certainly it was grim and um, to to producing novel that is or novels now that are they have elements of sci-fi and fantasy and they're not strictly young adult but they they've often been um described as, as young adult um, because they're um, dystopian young-ish heroine though actually she's in her early 20s um you know f female protagonist all of those things that made people very quickly say oh it's it's hunger games-esque kind of young adult yeah, um yeah. it's it's a big change and i i get asked about it without fail in every interview um because which is is an indication of of what a big sort of shift it is perceived as being to to shift from the literary to the um, the genre side and and this always really fascinates me. I'm um, I'm actually next Friday I'm doing a piece on the BBC about this same question because it's been such a recurring question whenever I'm interviewed or whenever I do a panel um, on uh, a literary festival. There's there's a sense I think that. Gee, you've come not not you've come down in the world necessarily, but a sense that it's it's a risky, possibly slightly shameful endeavour to go from the serious and worthy and literary to fantasy and sci-fi. And um, and I've enjoyed the fact that that it does sometimes make people uneasy that that I've done both. Um, and I think in a way that exposes the the arbitrariness of these these genre labels. I mean, the question of of what literary even means is a very fraught one and not one that I've ever seen a satisfactory answer to. Um, and again, these labels are, are always ideologically freighted, um, as we were saying with this idea of literary versus chick lit. I think the same goes with, um, with sci-fi and fantasy, that very often we see um, books that, that are, if you look at them in the cold light of day, absolutely speculative fiction. If you look at the writing of David Mitchell or Margaret Atwood, for example, yes. Uh, and these are some of the, you know, out of living, living writers, these are writers who are hugely acclaimed. Um, but there's very much a sense that that is in spite of writing genre fiction rather than because of it, um, that the genre fiction remains this um, slightly embarrassing, less worthy endeavour. Genre um, fiction's over there, but we'll take the best bits and we'll call it literature. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, that's very accurate. Uh, so I'm I'm not at all embarrassed to have written genre fiction. I've I've loved writing these sci-fi fantasy novels, and and being immersed more in that world has been fabulous because it's shown it's introduced me to a lot more brilliant genre writing as well. So, for example, to my great shame, I had never read um, Robin Hobb before I shared a publisher with her, and. Um, I will be forever grateful that my editor sent me a big box of Robin Hobb books and that's the beginning of a, a love affair I have just devoured, you know, um, in fact my laptop at the moment is perched on top of the hardback of Fool's Quest to bring it up to a more flattering angle. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I... that's not a small book either. <laughs> so I will go, you know, I will um, absolutely go to the mat defending the quality of Robin Hobbs' writing and the subtlety of her character development and the universality and importance of the themes that she is grappling with. And I think that there is many a literary novel that is ostensibly more serious and has more gravitas um, that has nowhere near the skill or literary aplomb of Robin Hobbs' writing. So I think these, look, these genre labels are reductive and arbitrary and, and often deeply, deeply loaded. Um, and it does fascinate me that without without fail that question is always asked because it seems I've sort of changed teams in some way by by jumping from literary to to fantasy, whatever those terms mean. Oh, look, I've just finished a two-year degree on writing and editing. Yeah. And if you're into genre, you know, and I've been I've been it's been strongly suggested that I remove all fantasy and sci-fi elements and. Yeah, and oh, you know, if you're going to write racism or disability or domestic violence, why why set it in a fantasy world? And it's like, oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> kind of critical narrow-mindedness that's just astonishing. Mm. And I wonder when it happens because we seem to understand that for children in children's literature, we t we read our children fairy tales and stories of the fantastical and nursery rhymes and. And we understand 
that the fantastical is a perfectly valid, in fact, in some ways, a necessary way for children to make sense of the world. And then when people become adults, there seems to be this sudden division that occurs where suddenly the fantastical becomes critically unacceptable. And it, it seems to me I've really sad. I've grown up, so I've put away childish things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but this assumption that the fantastical is limited to childhood is just so, um, so limiting and so damaging, I think. Mm. And again, it's just a missed opportunity and, and I pity those people who are too narrow-minded to seek the great pleasures in speculative fiction. I pity everyone who hasn't been able to pick up a Robin Hobb book just because of the, the genre because, you know, they're just missing out on some wonderful, wonderful writing. They really are. Now, you want to write a crime novel set in the English department of a university. Does this reveal a repressed desire to murder someone? I, I have to be careful when I talk about that because it does, the, the sort of headline of that does sound a lot like I had a miserable time in academia and I now want to murder my former colleagues. I, oh, I have read further. I know that you've enjoyed your time teaching and stuff like that, <laughs> but it just sounds so funny. I, um, I absolutely loved working um, in academia and in fact I'm still I'm still linked to the English department at the University of Chester and I was up there just a few weeks ago teaching a few sessions just for fun really because I, I love the teaching and I, and I love the department um, but I think if you've been immersed deeply in a world and you've seen its foibles and inconsistencies and quirks it's deeply deeply tempting to write about it yes. Um, yes. so I'm sure that my publisher's lawyers will want to look very carefully at the manuscript because of the the obvious connections that people will might make but I th uh, are likely to make but uh, I think I'm in the clear because I have such, um, I think it would be an affectionate take. It's a bit like I think of um, J.K. Rowling's second crime novel, um, which was set in the world of publishing and um, agents and editors and so on, which was great fun to read um, if, you, if you have had any experience of that world. But it seemed to me to be a very affectionate parody of that world and I, I expect that this crime novel, if I ever get the chance to write it properly, will be along the same lines. Well, another another book that doesn't actually involve a murder, I don't think, um, it's been a while now, but I think it was Monica McKerney's last book, was about a woman who had published a, a book and she'd been sent on a book tour and their publisher completely completely screwed it up that they, they chose her an image that wasn't her that didn't suit her and therefore didn't suit her readership and the whole thing failed and it's like you know publishers can be brave when they want to be <laughs> and it was a great book great yeah story. it's always so juicy and appealing isn't it to read about worlds that we have some understanding of ourselves mm. um, and to recognize characters like those that we know and to to feel like you're getting the inside jokes um, yes. But I, I mean, I read a lot of crime fiction. It's it's usually for for years and years that's been my go to for for light reading. So you know, a break from the Holocaust with a little light murder. <laughs> um, Do you have any particular books or authors? Oh, that I, that I enjoy. Mm. Um, I loved um, Yo Nesbo, the um, Scandi noir writer. Though he gets more and more and more violent. I love Val McDermott. I think her. Um, Tony Hill series is great. Um, I like uh, Peter Robinson. Um, oh, so many. Um, I'm, I'm not indiscriminate in my crime reading, but I do. I am fairly prolific. I, I read a lot of them, but there, there are a few that I've really enjoyed lately. Oh, and I devoured the, all the crime novels by P.D. James, who is so, I mean, she's kind of right wing and very upper class and she's very of her time. Um, but her Dalgleish mysteries are so wonderful. Well, I'll have to look into them because I absolutely love Children of Men. I, I have to confess I haven't read the book yet, but I love the movie. The movie is outstanding, though I wish that it had ended 30 seconds earlier than it did. I, without spoilers, there's a moment where it could have been left completely ambiguous and mm. like, and then there's a kind of something that happens literally in the last 30 seconds of the film and I wish yeah. they'd cut just before then. Um, the book is very, very different from the film, um, but they're, they're both really, really wonderful, I think. Mm. Yes, well, that was pretty amazing. What do you have planned for the future? Um, well, I've got to finish book three. Yes. Um, You'd like to get back to teaching? 
And, well, teaching at least in a very, very part-time capacity because it's a huge privilege and, and joy to be able to write full-time. Um, so, you know, if I could just go back in a, you know, even less than one day a week would, would suit me really well. Um, so poetry, I need to finish this collection that I started a million years ago. Um, I've got to write the crime novel and, you know, I, I probably could see myself writing more crime. And I have... Um, a book which people will probably call literary, we, you know, again, with the arbitrariness of these these labels, but um, it probably ticks those boxes that I've been thinking about for about 15 years and have finally started to actually write. And then just the other day I, I called my agent very excitedly because I had a new idea for a new fantasy YA series. So my problem is going to be picking which one of these projects to focus on first, um, and, you know, in between that, I'll try to have a life and raise my son and do all the non-writing things that I do. Mm. Who would win, Edward or Buffy? Oh, Buffy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no question. I mean, look, our pets is a, is a pretty young thing, but there's no question that Buffy would stake his heart before breakfast. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for speaking to Dark Matter. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.